we are going over Jamf 11 and Sonoma this month, and we are joined by a couple amazing Jamfs, Mark Buffington, Bill Smith, and uh, is Tom on this call as well, Mark or Bill? Um, I'm not sure. But either way, uh, we got a lot of amazing people on this call. Uh, as I like to say at the beginning of these, we have over half a millennia of combined Apple experience and Jamf experience with the people in this meetup. Um, and this one's going to be a little bit interactive as each of us has probably had a chance to play around with different parts of Jamf 11 and Sonoma. So we're going to try to make this interactive. There's going to be a lot of Jamf's talking. There's going to be me talking. Um, we're all going to learn a lot about what's happening with the new updates with Jamf and Apple. Uh, with that, I'm going to get into it. If I can figure out how to do this. So what's the agenda for today? A lot of stuff to go through. We got software update improvements. We've got the requiring a minimum Mac OS version, uh, requiring file vault, enforcing MDM management, pass keys and managed Apple IDs, platform single sign-on, Apple watch management, Apple configurator enhancements, network relays, and then we'll be ending with a Jamf Remote Assist demo. Now, I kind of utilized the keynote that I made for WWDC 2023 updates. And what I want to say about that is when we saw that back in June, um, I, I showed this, the information and technologies described within our subject to change. So that's what we saw in WWDC 2023. And now we're at the point where we're like, well, what does this actually look like now that these features exist? So that's what we'll be focusing on throughout this presentation. But more so than just Sonoma, Jamf dropped Jamf Pro 11, and we were super excited to try it out. And I just wanted to give my first impression of Jamf Pro 11, and I will say, it was very, very bright. It's very, it's very bright. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of white in it. Uh, maybe don't open it for the first time in the middle of the night. It will blow you away. Um, but the features are what we're going to actually focus on during this time, not just the dashboard and GUI. So I want to talk first about the software update improvements. This is probably the thing most of us are the most excited about with Sonoma software updates, specifically Mac OS updates, has been a pain point for Mac admins since probably Big Sur when things started changing drastically and the you know M1 computers as well. Uh, so this is what they talked about. Oops. Um, is this video going? Okay, there we go. Uh, this is what they talked about during WWDC. Um, this ability for users to be able to um, delay these updates, but also for admins to be able to push it based on a schedule and give users a bunch of different notifications and finally force that update in a way that's a little bit more user-friendly, something we hadn't seen. So what does this look like? Well, in Jamf Pro, we use the new software updates area. And this is really what we're seeing with Sonoma, this ability to deploy it at a specific date, which is pretty cool. Now, with the test I did, I didn't get to say, hey, let's do this over the course of two weeks and see what it looks like. But I wanted to give you a couple screenshots on what we see here. So the user, when they need to push their update, will see this little box. It'll allow them to either update right now or wait until it forces it. And then um, when it forces the update and it's about to restart, they get this nice restart message, which is another thing we hadn't seen in the past. It only gives them 60 seconds. Interesting thing though. So when I was testing this, I chose to update it right away, even though it wasn't gonna force me to do it for an hour. Um, it didn't actually restart until that forced time that um, was set before. So it waited an hour before it actually restarted my Mac, which I guess is eh, maybe kind of nice. But I do want to talk about something that really is the, I think the pain point in software updates 
And it really doesn't have necessarily anything to do with Jamf or, or Apple. It's just the fact that everyone's using laptops nowadays. And if you're going to push a software update, if you're going to push a Mac OS update, that requires, you know, a lot of disk space. It requires the user, the computer to be on for a while. Um, and it requires a lot of those things. There's a lot of stuff that can interrupt it, right? So one of the things we're really hoping for is more status messages as we go through these updates. Because the problem is you push an update to all your computers, you allow it for a couple deferrals or something, a week goes by and you come back and only 30% of your fleet has updated. And then cybersecurity is asking, why haven't more people updated? And it's like, well, I don't know if it's because the computers don't have enough disk space, if they didn't have enough battery life in order to do the update, um, if they you know, restarted their computer in the middle of the installation and interrupted everything, if the MDM command just isn't going through, like there's not much statuses to tell us that all we can do is look at the management logs of the computer and you can only do that individually for each computer. So it's kind of a mess. Um, but these new software update statuses seemed pretty promising where it's like, hey, we're gonna get some more stuff that says what's happening because we're using declarative device management, which gives us a lot more abilities. So um, these are not baked into the Jamf GUI yet. I don't know if they will be, but one thing we were able to find is that they are in the API. So you can do an API command, look up an individual computer by ID. You can also look up a group of computers as well and get a giant list. I'm just showing it for one individual computer. Uh, one thing I'll say with a little bit of testing that I did with this, um, I'm not fully able to understand what to do with this information. And what I mean by it is th there's, first of all, these two different things happening here. Uh, this is one API call, but I'm getting two different results and each with an update status um, ID to it. And then it also didn't always seem to correlate with what's happening. Um, like for instance, on the top one, you'll see that download, it says false, but status says installing. So it's clearly past the downloaded status. Um, I'm hoping that I can figure out what will, what is really happening here. Cause if I can, like, that's something we, where we could create a GUI or something like that. Um, but I'm going to call on someone from Jamf to talk through, I don't know if Mark, if you understand what's happening here. Sure, sure. Th th thanks, Chris. Um, uh, for those that, that don't know me, my, my name is Mark Buffington. I'm a consulting engineer here at Jamf based in Minneapolis. Um, overlay for some of our, our sales teams, other customer facing teams as well, do a lot of enablement and a lot of Apple uh, beta testing and, and things like that. So um, with this, I mean, this particular screen here, there's two different events. One of them is, is from an uh, historic update uh, from looks like it's uh, last December. But regardless, what you may be noticing in a lot of of newer functionality so, within Jamf Pro. So Mark, not to interrupt yeah. you, but the one on the bottom is actually a different update. So this isn't the one yep. I pushed. Yep. Oh, yep. that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and and some some of these things um uh, for anyone who's been seeing newer features develop with Jamf you'll often see a lot of things exposed in the API first and ultimately those are the same objects that our team uh is relying upon as we build out new things in the GUI so as there's more status and reporting and kind of things in aggregate it's going to be pulling from these same endpoints um I know I, I mentioned these status endpoints to you uh, uh, this week, just kind of a for reference, because that data is getting sent back through the declarative status channel um, in that first one there. You, you can see that the bottom one is using the um, more legacy OS update status query, which um, doesn't really give much useful information um, compared to the, the newer declarative ones. But uh, just to chime in, I guess, since I'm talking, I love the resilience of declarative uh, device management updates because say if, if a device was unplugged and uh, low on battery or something like that, and in the past, right when the OS update was gonna happen, it would simply just fail and you would have to have a server side command sent out again to make it take place. 
Um, but now with declarative, if, if it fails to update for some reason, it schedules out and notifies the user that it couldn't be installed. It's going to try again in an hour and rinse, repeat. It, it never forgets that it had that declaration, that um, marching order and command that every hour it's, it's simply going to try again. And once those conditions are right, um, then it's going to be able to make that update happen as well. Yeah, that that's amazing. And, you know, I, I wish I had like 10 computers and, you know, a month to just test software updates and see all the caveats of how that will work. But yeah, I do think with declarative, you know, talking to you, Mark, hearing what you're saying, like this will be a lot better than we've seen in the previous three versions where we just seen so much inconsistency in those updates. So I'm hoping that's going to be kind of the silver bullet to make this easy. Um, and I'm interested to test out this API command more too and see if we can find more useful information for the status of where a computer at is at during those updates. So I can at least tell the cybersecurity team, all right, well, we've got, you know, 40% of the people got it downloaded and 60% um, are at this stage of the process. Um, yeah, and and also too, um, another benefit of declarative device management and status channel is that um, you don't need to have another inventory update or recon to happen for inventory, smart groups, other actions to take place too, uh, again, because of that declarative status channel. So once it does, say if you're on 14.0 and you go to 14.1, that first boot up immediately is going to inform Jamf of the new OS um, and then any other actions, reporting, uh, et cetera, that you want can follow downstream. Awesome. Cool. Uh, we'll be given more updates on this once we do like our first big security push um, with Sonoma and see how easy these updates are compared to uh, previous versions. Moving on, I'm going to talk about automated device enrollment and some of the improvements to that. Uh, first of all, requiring a minimum Mac OS version. That was one of the cool things that was announced. Um, unfortunately, at this point, um, you know, talking to Mark and other people at Jamf, this has not been implemented yet, mostly because of the difficulties of testing this um, with Mac OS betas. So this is coming soon, I believe. Um, but, you know, probably by in the next couple months, hopefully, we'll have more of an update on this. Yeah, and stay, stay tuned. Um, really, any of our betas, uh, I, I assume anyone in a meetup audience like this is in Apple's betas and is in Jamf's betas. Uh, so as those things come out, you can, can check it out. Um, and as Chris was saying, I know during the summer, at least, as things were, were being tested with this, uh, it was kind of an impossible feat because if you were going from one 14.0 beta build to the next 14.0 beta build, um, the device isn't going to be able to see that beta software update seed without the newer process of signing in with an Apple ID and opting into the, the beta stream. So that kind of slowed some things down. And um, thankfully, now that we do have more public releases of macOS out, um, can get some better testing and validation with that. Perfect. Um, next thing I wanted to talk about was requiring file vault. So we have this ability to do this in um, Jamf now. It was actually in the last version as well. But basically, click the button to force file vault enablement. And then also, this is very important, make sure in your pre-stage, you also allow that profile. Um, and that's going to be important because, and this is uh, this is what the user sees. Um, it, it's very similar to how it was before. It's a little bit better of a screen, but after, at least when we were using Jamf Connect, after that first user account is created, it would prompt us in order to enable file vault encryption. Just a different prompt screen, really. Um, but the thing I want to point out is right now there is a product issue that if you force enable uh, this during the setup assistant and you haven't deployed it during the setup assistant, like I showed in the pre-stage, um, it will create some issues for the computer. So make sure that you do that 
Um, it might even be recommended that you only deploy this to computers that are being um, enrolled through that pre-stage. Otherwise, that could create problems as well um, for computers that may be enrolled through user-initiated enrollment or something else. Um, this also may be something that'll be fixed in a future release since this is a product issue right now. Um, so to to add to that, I, I was actually the one who helped get that message in there uh, as a warning. So it, it's something we're tracking it with a, a PI number, um, but it's not a, a, a Jamf issue. It's, it's more of how this profile uh, applies if you're applying it after the setup assistant. So... Um, a file vault profile typically has that element of deferred enablement where you choose login, you choose log out. Um, but now with the force enable and the setup assistant, um, Mac OS simply ignores those other keys that are that are in there. So it's it's more of this this guidance here is more of a of a heads up that says, hey, if you are going to use this force in the setup assistant, cool. Um, but you may want to fork out and have two different file vault profiles, one that goes to just general enrollment, one that goes to automated device enrollment, um, and have that toggle set up differently each time. So um, it is something that we're also trying to escalate with Apple, see if there can be some behavior change with that as well. Um, so it's kind of why it's it's set up here in the, in the meantime as a FYI, because File Vault, of course, is a, a very important part of everyone's workflows, or or should be, uh, if if it's not yet, uh, to have that be managed and kind of one of those first things you get set up. Yeah. And Mark, we were talking yesterday about um, a different way to enable File Vault using Jamf Connect that didn't require any user interaction. Um, and that might be something that we do for a later presentation because that's something I didn't even know was possible. Sure. Yeah. So stay tuned if you were like, hey, yeah, so you can enable File Vault without notifying the user and without user interaction. Correct, Mark? Yep. Yeah. And that's using Jam Connect. So we'll probably have a later presentation for that because that seems pretty cool. See the caveats of that and how to deploy it. Um, next is enforcing. Uh, automated device enrollment. Now, when I first saw this with WWDC, I kind of thought this doesn't seem all that cool because file automated device enrollment is kind of enforced anyway if it's in DEP. Um, I know there's there are kind of ways to get around it and stuff like that too. So the nice thing is if someone doesn't connect to Wi-Fi, goes through the setup assistant, it will force them to enroll later, which is nice. But the one thing I thought was really cool that I wanted to show is the way it changes our workflow for migrating computers from like one MDM to Jamf Pro. Um, so here's an example that I created uh, very quickly. Before what would happen during this workflow is we'd have a little notification come up from the side telling them to install the profile. Now it looks like this where they get a full screen window prompting them to log in and enroll their Mac. It doesn't op open profiles. It doesn't do any of that. It's like a nice window that pops up. So this is anytime you use the profiles renew dash type enrollment command, this will pop up if it's in DEP with their MDM provider. So I think this looks really cool and it's a much better workflow than we were doing in the past for migrating a computer over to uh, Jamf Pro for an, uh, another MDM. Also, if you want to just like if a computer removes enrollment or something like that and needs to get enrolled again, this is also going to be better. Moving on, talk about pass keys and managed Apple IDs. Another thing we saw with WWDC. Um, so the new features they talked about is forcing touch ID and face ID, being able to control the iCloud keychain, which was kind of cool. Um, using Face ID and Touch ID to log into corporate products um, and defining what users can log into. Um, the only problem with this is using managed Apple IDs, which a lot of us really don't use in a corporate setting. Um, but feel free to drop it in the chat if you are using managed Apple IDs in a corporate setting. Um, some of the caveats with this, though. 
So you can't have a personal Apple ID and a managed Apple ID through the same iCloud keychain. And an MDM can't force users to sign in with only their managed Apple ID. So for instance, if they sign in with a personal Apple ID, you can't really manage the keychain because they need to be signed in with a managed Apple ID um, in order to make that work. Um, so you can kind of set this up, but there's a lot of things that can go wrong with it. Um, Mark, if you have anything you want to add to that. Um, not specifically from a Jamf perspective. Um, it, it is something that I, I can at least say from uh, customer conversations I've had uh, with other people as well. There's, there is certainly more momentum starting to happen for people to start adopting managed Apple IDs. And um, really the, the, the key to that is the user experience and federation, which sometimes uh, folks are, are hesitant about. Do you federate? And, and what's what's the reward you get on the other side? So Apple is certainly starting to stack uh, and, and put their thumb down on the scale to um, to really kind of move things from only things like account driven enrollment types to now have some other services. Um, but yet, uh, as this slide shows, there there are a few things that um, are still kind of the, like that last little bit that uh, uh, we do hear from a lot of organizations that it's like, oh well. How do I make it so only a managed Apple ID can be signed in on a supervised device? Um, and that's uh, just not possible today. So um, as with anything, and, and I don't know, I, I might sound kind of like a Apple people you hear as well, like file feedback, file those feature requests with Jamf if there's something on our side that that we want to do and, and, and give those stories of what you're uh, actually trying to accomplish. Uh, and some of those goals as as you do those feedbacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's always good advice. Um, and I wanted to talk about this as well. So you can restrict sign-in uh, for managed Apple IDs via an MDM. But I do want to point out that this is not supported yet by Jamf. So even though you can see it in Apple Business Manager, if you're using managed Apple IDs, don't turn this on or they won't be able to log into it if it's enrolled in Jamf. Um, next, I wanna move on to talk about platform single sign-on. This is one of those things we've kind of seen several times throughout the WWDC, um, and they seem to be adding more features to it. Um, so two of the things they talked about, one was being able to create a local user account using platform SSO um, and access from system settings to be able to access platform SSO. Both these things seemed really cool, but of course they have to be supported by an identity provider. Um, so I was able to test out doing this through Okta and I'll show you what the experience looks like. Um, go ahead and log in, click set up. enter your password, and then you know, I need to do two-factor authentication. And then I was really excited to see what this would look like. Um, and then it, uh, it didn't work. So stay tuned. I might come back with the ability to actually do this. Um, <laughs> but it looks like we're still working out some kinks with Okta in order to get that to work. Um, what will this be? Will it be like kind of a cool thing? People are wondering if this will be a replacement for Jamf Connect. Um, at this point, I've still never been able to test this out with any identity provider, so I can't say much. Um, with platform single sign-on, um, I just wanted to call out a couple things with it as well, as far as more resources. Um, Firstly, from a Jamf perspective, um, MDM is required. So single sign-on extension payloads, which Jamf supports both the V1 and the V2 uh, SSO extension payloads. So if you have an identity provider that supports platform single sign-on, either the, the V1 type from uh, Ventura that, that was announced, or um, which currently I'm aware of Okta and Microsoft having those in, in preview modes to be able to test. 
And that's going to be testing for the Mac OS 13 Ventura features uh, with platform single sign-on. And to, to look at it, it's, it's more of making that user experience good on the machine where like, yes, you, you can synchronize a password uh, and, and work with that. But single sign-on extensions are really about being that simple, uh, uh, no password needed authentication as you open up compatible applications, websites, um, you just automatically get signed in and reusing that uh, trusted authentication that's on the device, which is pretty cool. The Sonoma features, uh, there are some where uh, people might look at it and be like, oh, local account creation at the login window. Um, is this something, do I need to um, get rid of Jamf Connect if that's something that you're using for provisioning just-in-time users or things like that? Um, but that's not exactly quite there yet. Um, with platform single sign-on, there's elements like the login window um, uh, does not support any sort of MFA or multi-factor authentication. Um, and then it's also not really built for like a, a zero touch feature either. So um, Joel Rennick has a great session that he did some live demos at Maxis Admin uh, 2023 recently. So he goes through all of these different steps and the user experience of it. But with it, I kind of look at it as something that might benefit, or, or rather the V2 Sonoma features that, that, that nobody's shipping could benefit something like a computer lab where uh, on first setup through automated device enrollment, an administrator has to be in user space and register with the identity provider. So, so there does need to be some hands on there. But if you're using the new Sonoma features of PSSO, you can enable this shared keys functionality uh, if the IDP supports it, where at the login window, the next user accounts can be provisioned and be set standard or, or admin uh, when it comes to those as well. So um, not really a zero touch replacement, not the same as, as other things that Connect does as well. And who knows, we might not see it for another year from the IDPs as well uh, for the Sonoma features that are there. But check out Joel's session. Uh, if you're curious on this, it goes way into the nitty gritty, uh, good details there. Well, thanks for that info, Mark. Uh, next is Apple Watch Management. Kind of a cool thing we saw at WWDC. A um, couple things must be paired to a managed iPhone and users prompted to enroll and you can't enforce it. Um, talk through a couple of the management capabilities here. Um, talk through a couple different ways to deploy apps. It can be a paired app, a dependent app, or a standalone app that's just on the Apple Watch and not the iPhone. Um, and this is something where kind of wanted to reach out and see what type of feedback people have. Um, so this seems cool. Personally, this isn't something we're looking to do for any organizations that we manage. Um, and I don't know if anyone else has a use case for their like, I really want to be able to manage an Apple Watch. Um, it's cool when you see a new type of management thing. But I think as as Todd said in the chat, we ignore the watches. That's I think kind of the sentiment so far, um, but yeah, if anyone has any use cases or anything like that, feel free to drop it in the chat. Feel free to speak up if you want. Uh, when it comes to watches, as this screen says, uh, if you have use cases that you want, um, our product teams are actively uh, working with customers that have interest. Like if, if it's a serious interest for, for watch management, uh, they're having those conversations, helping uh, validate research and, and work as as um, as that gets looked at here as well. Um, but it is kind of a different scenario. Uh, there's new uh, app APIs, as the previous slide was showing, different types of apps, uh, which are different flags that kind of weren't there before in the old um, apps and books APIs that vendors use. So it's kind of a bunch of new systems and a holistic management of a supervised iPhone and a watch that need to be uh, effectively treated almost as one managed object. So different ways, some, some different things, but if you've got the use cases, uh, please, please share. Hey, mm -hmm. hey, Mark, this is Chris Luger. How you doing? Hey, Chris. Hey, Chris. Uh, 
Hey, man. Uh, so actually, interestingly enough, uh, I was just talking to Tim Knox a couple weeks ago about Apple Watch. Um, those of you that may not know me, I'm uh, I'm an enterprise SE at, at Apple, uh, based in Minneapolis. So, um, but I I was talking to Tim Knox about Apple Watch because I, I see so much potential. Um, and I just want to be transparent. I was also talking to Adigy and some others, right? Finding out where the focus is, where's the priority with really managing Apple Watch, right? And um, I just want to share again use cases, right? So I do have uh, do have an account that build uh, that has built uh, some custom, uh, basically enterprise watch apps for disinfecting and cleaning, so they can you know, interact with a watch app to identify if I'm going to go into this facility and wipe it down. I'm going to disinfect it. And the watch also then will track motion of my hand as I'm actually like wiping down surfaces and that type of thing. So that's one use case where I have seen, um, seen it being used. And I have other, like you mentioned, Mark, you know, really is these are meant to be managed as a pair, right? Supervised phone with Apple Watch. And I do have, there are other use cases where I have uh, organizations where uh, a shift worker would, you know, go to their locker, they check out a, a watch and a phone for their shift, and then they use it for their shift and the watch can be anything from corporate communication to uh, task list. But also, you know, we look at it as much as, you know, health and safety too, right? We're looking at, you know, sound notifications, um, you know, trip and fall detection, uh, that type of thing. So that's just a couple of the use cases that I've seen in the enterprise and just wanted to share. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Good to hear from you again, Chris. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for sending over the invite. I'll try to be here when I can. I'd love to have you on any of these. Always good to get feedback from Apple. I can't be the only person that thinks that that, that that's kind of crazy, the, what you were saying about the use case with tracking the motion on the watches. That's, um, I feel like that could go in so many different directions. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I'm still waiting for someone to make a really good air guitar app for my Apple Watch. That'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're bringing back, <laughs> bringing back Guitar Hero. Cool. Moving on, I want to talk through some of the Apple configurator enhancements. Um, there's there's really one main thing I want to talk through, and uh, it's the ability to automatically assign a device to a specific MDM server. Um, and I have a quick screenshot of what that looks like on iOS. Pretty simple. Um, you can either choose a default server uh, for the MDM assignment, or you can choose a specific one if the default one uh, doesn't isn't the one you actually want to enroll for this device. I uh, didn't get a screenshot for Mac OS though. Um, oh yeah, and this uh, shortcuts for Apple configurator. Um, I didn't actually get a screenshot of what this looked like, but this is what it looked like in the, um, the presentation back in for WWDC. Um, Talk about network relays next. So um, one thing they talked about is this is a replacement for corporate VPNs. Uh, can be deployed by a configuration profile. Um, and it can be developed into applications and it's available for tbOS. All sounds like cool stuff. Um, I haven't actually seen any real world scenarios where this was being done. I don't know if anyone has any examples. Um, it's not actually in Jam Pro yet, but I was able to pull up an iMazing profile screenshot of it. Um, again, until this is implemented somewhere, I can't really say how it works or how well it works. But does anyone have any examples or use cases of network relays being used anywhere in their environments? And yeah, it would likely have to be something that your uh, existing uh, vendor for things like VPN would have to be implementing. Um, uh, but certainly I, I don't want to hog the air here. I'm curious to hear if, if people have vendors that are, that are using those as well too. Um, just if there's anything that I can relay back to others here at Jamf. I have a feeling that something like this is probably going to take 
some time to be implemented into any application. So it'll probably be another year before we actually see this anywhere. Strikes me a, a, just a little bit reminiscent of uh, Tor network. Uh, network relays? If you were using a variety of relays, um, you know, to, to sequence through, I don't know if that if that's actually doable with that or not, but that was the first thing that kind of struck me as a an application of it. If you were in an unsafe area of the world, for example, and and okay. needed to get uh, you know information out that way. I was wondering more if it was more along the lines of like Zscaler private access or something where you set up servers that have <clears throat> access to other things. And it does a certificate based, you know, some sort of certificate based authentication that gets you to access to something internal. Yeah, Chris, this Private. is Matt. Um, th that's what I was kind of thinking too. I wasn't 100% sure what you were asking, but, you know, we have some legacy older, I hate saying products or, you know, see, you know, content management admin pages that people will like to lock down by IP address and then with. Mm everyone remote you could come through that same address maybe i'm not sure yeah no i think all that's a possibility i believe it needs to be like someone needs to implement it into an application or something like that for it like you can't just implement this now without having something in place i believe but me not having a background as a network engineer sometimes i not quite sure how all the stuff works <laughs> Um, moving on, the last thing I wanted to do, um, Mark uh, provided me with a demo of what Jamf Remote Exist looks like. Um, so this is on the beta. So this isn't available yet on the current version. But if you look up a computer, you go to the management tab and you click start session. Um, if it's a Jamf managed computer, they just click the allow button. And it allows them to allows you to screen share their screen. One thing I think is very interesting about this, you can see right now the screen is being shared. The user is not required to enable screen recording in order for this to work. I don't know how that is the case, but um, kind of cool. So users are able to do. You're able to see the user screens. They do have to accept it, but after that, they don't have to go into system preferences and enable screen recording. Mark, you can talk through what's happening right now and shortcuts if you want. Sure, sure. Um, so this this was uh, a demo that I I shared. Um, actually, had it recorded, and and uh, parts of it were in the JNUC keynote, and then also in the um, at the JF booth. If anyone was at JNUC. Um, but being that it's still in beta, I, I figured, hey, instead of a live demo, we can show this anyone who's in the beta program with Jamf uh, sign in at Jamf account to sign up for the beta, get that beta instance and it just stays up to date uh, as new betas come out. But um, with this, uh, it is something that users are notified as a session starts, they have to get permission for it. Um, the actual demo here, I, I know it's a little bit small, but it's something that once I learned about this new thing this summer of uh, accessibility shortcuts. So the shortcuts app, if you look for accessibility on Mac OS or iOS, there's some awesome things where you just put in what sort of things you need help with. And then the shortcuts app spits out a whole list of different Apple KBs, tutorials, et cetera, that, that can help you with those accessibility things. So um, if you don't know about those and, and, want to support that for your users, uh, have them check it out. Um, my wife's a special ed teacher. And immediately when I learned about this, like that's something we got to got to show in, in a demo here to, to really look at that element of people helping people uh, and doing cool things with Apple tech. On the general topic of remote assist as well, um, check it out. There's, there's going to be a lot more documentation and uh, information that's that's out there um, uh, soon as as things get released, um, just to to kind of take that a, a step further, but but certainly a nice tool to have in the toolkit if if you're looking to assist users uh, and be able to uh, to help out in those screen sharing type of 
of uh, of, of needs uh, with James Managed Devices. I mean, it looks pretty cool. Um, we just got the beta and started fooling around with it. Um, but yeah, I, this this looks like it's going to be amazing. A really cool replacement for other screen sharing tools, and honestly, it looks much easier. There were some people asking, is there going to be any additional cost to this? Do you know, Mark, or even have? Um, no, no cost differences. Um, well, and I'm starting to respond to a question in chat uh, asking if it's available for on-prem. Uh, yes, it is available for on-prem as well. Oh, um, it is something that Jamf Cloud does function as a relay. So you need to have an active uh, cloud services connector uh, enabled and the right uh, network traffic that, that we have documented to get to that. And then if you are on-prem, uh, if you're in the process of enabling, you would choose what Jamf Cloud global region you would be using as that relay for, um, for the um, session registration actions and, and things like that. So um, that's something, if you're on-prem, you should be able to see it uh, in 11.1. Um, and if you're in the beta, of course, uh, can, can test that out with a a free cloud hosted instance with our beta program, which that gives everyone access to. All right, so um, like... I, was gonna, I was gonna speculate on something. You, the, you mentioned earlier that the um, remote access doesn't require um, like screen recording abilities, but I, I guess you guys probably have noticed that neither does Apple remote desktop, which I always found very interesting. So I'm wondering, is that what Jamf is utilizing is uh, that that Apple, um, like the ARD agent or the screen sharing agent or something like that? So I, I'm not familiar with with all the, the, the tech on that yet. However, mm -hmm. there is an element of if you are trying to log in, um, say, say you've got like a, a Zoom room or something like that, um, maybe it did a software update and it didn't auto log in, uh, for example, and it's just stuck at the login window. If you have remote... Um, remote desktop enabled. So you say use the MDM command to enable remote desktop. Um, then Jamf Remote Assist can allow for an administrator user to authenticate. Um, and, and that is using some of the ARD functions there to start the, the user space session and, and get logged in that way. So um, that's maybe like a real world example that if anyone is managing Macs in, in a Zoom room, um, uh, might be a great piece in the tool belt. So we've got, uh, I don't want to cut you off, Howie, but we've got, uh, we've only got four or five minutes yeah. left here. Okay, I'll shut um, up. I don't, I don't think we have a hard stop, but I think we do have a soft spot or a soft stop. Um, so if anybody else has any questions, I think we can probably go at least a couple minutes over. Um, yeah, and I've if you don't have any questions, go ahead, Hugo. About remote since we're still on that topic. So when you check that security box, it deploys that Jamf remote assist uh, PPPC profile to the device when self-service updates. Uh, one thing I noticed since the Jampers are here was my machine I was logging into from the Jamf Pro admin console using remote was on 14.1 and I was getting prompted for Finder. It said connect assist wanted to, to control Finder. So I had to create a separate PPPC profile for that. Um, have you guys heard of that at Jamf? Has that been brought to your attention yet? I personally have not seen that, but it may be dependent on on the the action in use. Um, I believe I have seen some people give some feedback on that, uh, ha having ran into that. But um, but it is something that, as it is coming out, more and more refinements uh, are coming for for better logging, better uh, other things uh, uh, on there as well. But um, but the default PPPC should be able to make um, everything work as you need it to with the remote assist. Awesome. All right, thank you for that. And the last one was you had mentioned the logging, which was I was going to follow up with that. When I'm, I'm playing with this, the loggings, I, I find stuff in the, the MDM commands that are sent, but there's no like logging, like history tracking. And I think that's going to be a big ask. Is that something you guys have in the pipeline for this? Like, are you going to add like a history to what admin initiated a call with what computer? 
I'm not an official person to represent of what yeah. exactly is coming when, but yes, that is, okay. that is definitely something that is desired from uh, everyone internally and different uh, uh, external to jamp folks as well. So, um, but certainly uh, it is something we are still in the time of feedback uh, wanting to get some more things refined, but at the same time, wanting people to get more, more hands on it uh, now that it's been run through the, through the ringer a, a little bit more. Where is that chat Thank box? You. Right. If you go to settings on the Jamf Pro dashboard, if you go to uh, settings and then computer management, the computer management tab, and then you go to security, if you're on 11.1, I don't even know if I'm supposed to say this, but there's a checkbox for remote assist if you have the beta and mm -hmm. you can click that. And then that, I believe from what I gathered, I believe then the next time you run a check-in on that on an end user machine associated with that server after that checkbox has been selected, self-service will update and then it'll deploy that uh, PPPC profile to allow Jamf Connect or a Jamf Remote to uh, connect to the device. I may be wrong. I'm not a jamper. This is just me playing with a, a machine. But yeah, that's where you'd find it. So real the quick. Policy and then, so the policy, a policy run then triggered an NDM send. Is that what you're saying? Well, so whenever self, so I believe it's through a, a mechanism where once the computer checks into jamf, then it gets that update of that checkbox that you just selected. Does that make sense? Yeah, so not a recon, just a check-in. I don't know for sure. That's okay. what I found. That's what I found worked. So real quick here, guys, before it is the top of the hour, um, I think we can go over for about 10 minutes. Oh, this is horrifying. Whatever's about to fill in there. Um, but I just want to say, so our next meetup will be on Friday, December 1st, and we will actually be having Dan Snelson presenting on his tool, Set Up Your Mac. So oh, for those awesome. of you that, that know Dan Snelson, that should be a very exciting presentation. And if you don't know Dan Snelson, uh, just take our word for it. It'll be a really exciting presentation. And that'll be on December 1st at noon mountain time. Um, also, just one more tidbit, we can get back to questions. For those of you that haven't been on this meetup before or not familiar with you know, what this meetup is or even how you found yourself here. So we're Rocketman Tech hosting this meetup. We are a Jamf services partner, a Jamf MSP. And if you guys have any sort of difficult situations or you're looking for insight or consulting related to Jamf, this is our bread and butter. So please feel free to reach out to us at rocketman.tech. Um, other than that, thank you guys so much for coming. I don't want to take up any more time. So I think we do have about 10 minutes that we can go over if anybody else has any other questions. But thank you everyone for coming. And also in the wise words of Eric Pye, please like and subscribe. What are, what are we asking them to like here? Uh, well, that that's if they're listening on the YouTube this, Oh, channel. that's right. I for, forgot that we're live streaming. Okay. <laughs> I was like, are we just asking them to like this internally? You know, in, in the kindness of your heart, please just, you know, like this. Like it internally too. Yeah, that'd be great. We just, we just want to be like. Button if you're watching this on YouTube. <laughs>